Oh, right, Sadie said. I remember now. I knew she was just saying that to shut him up, but my dad wouldn't let it go. Sadie, he said, until this stone was discovered, regular mortals, uh, I mean, no one had been able to read hieroglyphics for centuries. The written language of Egypt had been completely forgotten. Then an Englishman named Thomas Young proved that the Rosetta Stone's three languages all conveyed the same message. A Frenchman named Champollion took up the work and cracked the code of hieroglyphics. Sadie chewed her gum, unimpressed. What's it say then? Dad shrugged. Nothing important. It's basically a thank you letter from some priest to King Ptolemy V. When it was first carved, the stone was no big deal. But over the centuries, over the centuries it has become a powerful symbol. Perhaps the most important connection between ancient Egypt and the modern world. I was a fool not to realise its potential sooner. He'd lost me, and apparently the curator too. Dr Kane, he asked, are you quite all right? Dad breathed deeply. My apologies, Dr Martin. I was just thinking aloud. If I could have a glass removed, and if you could bring me the papers I asked for from your archives, Dr Martin nodded. He pressed a code into a small remote control, and the front of the glass box clicked open. It will take a few moments to retrieve the notes, Dr Martin said. For anyone else, I would hesitate to grant unguarded access to the stone, as you'd requested. I trust you'll be careful. He glanced at us kids like we were troublemakers. We'll be careful, Dad promised. As soon as Dr Martin's steps receded, Dad turned to us with a frantic look in his eyes. Children, this is very important have to stay out of this room. He slipped his work bag off his shoulder and unzipped it just enough to pull out a bike chain and padlock. Follow Dr Martin. You'll find his office at the end of the great court on the left. There's only one entrance. Once he's inside, wrap this around the door handles and lock it tight. We need to delay him. You want us to lock him in? Sadie asked, suddenly interested. Brilliant. Dad, I said, what's going on? We don't have time for explanations, he said. This will be our only chance. They're coming. Who's coming? Sadie asked. He took Sadie by the shoulders. Sweetheart, I love you, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry for many things, but there's no time now. If this works, I promise I'll make everything better for all of us. Carter, you're my brave man. You have to trust me. Remember, lock up Dr. Martin, then stay out of this room. Chaining the curator's door was easy, but as soon as we'd finished, we looked back the way we'd come and saw blue light streaming from the Egyptian gallery, as if our dad had installed a giant glowing aquarium. Sadie locked eyes with me. Honestly, do you have any idea what he's up to? None, I said. But he's been acting strange lately, thinking a lot about Mum. He keeps her picture. I didn't want to say more. Fortunately, Sadie nodded like she understood. What's in his work bag? she asked. I don't know. He told me never to look. Sadie raised an eyebrow. And you never did. God, I so like you, Carter. You're hopeless. I wanted to defend myself, but just then, a tremor shook the floor. Startled, Sadie grabbed my arm. He told us to stay put. I suppose you're going to follow that order too. Actually, that order was sounding pretty good to me. But Sadie sprinted down the hall, and after a moment's hesitation... I ran after her. When we reached the entrance of the Egyptian gallery, we stopped dead in our tracks. Our dad stood in front of the Rosetta Stone with his back to us. A blue circle glowed on the floor around him, as if someone had switched on hidden neon tubes in the floor. My dad had thrown off his overcoat. His work bag lay open at his feet, revealing a wooden box about two feet long, painted with Egyptian images. What's he holding? Sadie whispered to me. Is that a boomerang? Sure enough, when Dad raised his hand, he was brandishing a curved white stick. It did look like a boomerang, but instead of throwing the stick, he touched it to the Rosetta Stone. Sadie caught her breath. Dad was writing on the stone. Wherever the boomerang made contact, glowing blue lines appeared on the granite. Hieroglyphs. It made no sense. How could he write glowing words with a stick? But the image was bright and clear. Ram's horns above a box and an X. Open, Sadie murmured. I stared at her, because it sounded like she had just translated the word, but that was impossible. I'd been hanging around Dad for years, and even I could read only a few hieroglyphs. They are seriously hard to learn. Dad raised his arms. He chanted, 
Woosia IE, and two more hieroglyphic symbols burnt blue against the surface of the Rosetta Stone. As stunned as I was, I recognised the first symbol. It was the name of the Egyptian god of the dead. Woosia, I whispered. I'd never heard it pronounced that way, but I knew what it meant. Osiris. Osiris come, Sadie said, as if in a trance. Then her eyes widened. No, she shouted. Dad, no! My father turned in surprise. He started to say, children, but it was too late. The ground rumbled. The blue light turned to searing white, and the Rosetta Stone exploded. When I regained consciousness, the first thing I heard was laughter. Horrible, gleeful laughter mixed with the blare of museum security alarms. I felt like I'd just been run over by a tractor. I sat up, dazed, and spat a piece of Rosetta Stone out of my mouth. The gallery was in ruins. Waves of fire rippled in pools along the floor. Giant statues had toppled. Sarcophagi had been knocked off their pedestals. Pieces of the Rosetta Stone had exploded outwards with such force that they'd embedded themselves in the columns, the walls and the other exhibits. Sadie was passed out next to me, but she looked unharmed. I shook her shoulder and she grunted, Ugh. In front of us, where the Rosetta Stone had been, stood a smoking, sheared-off pedestal. The floor was blackened in a starburst pattern, except for the glowing blue circle around our father. He was facing our direction, but he didn't seem to be looking at us. A bloody cut ran across his scalp. He gripped the boomerang tightly. I didn't understand what he was looking at. Then the horrible laughter echoed around the room again, and I realised it was coming from right in front of me. Something stood between our father and us. At first I could barely make it out, just a flicker of heat, but as I concentrated, it took on a vague form, the fiery outline of a man. He was taller than Dad, and his laugh cut through me like a chainsaw. Well done, he said to my father. Very well done, Julius. You were not summoned, my father's voice trembled. He held up the boomerang, but the fiery man front of one finger. The stick flew from Dad's hand, shattering against the wall. I am never summoned, Julius, the man purred. But when you open a door, you must be prepared for guests to walk through. Back to the duat, my father roared. I have the power of the great king. Oh, scary, the fiery man said with amusement. And even if you knew how to use that power, which you do not, he was never my match. I am the strongest. Now you will share his fate. I couldn't make sense of anything, but I knew that I had to help my dad. I tried to pick up the nearest chunk of stone, but I was so terrified my fingers felt frozen and numb. My hands were useless. Dad shot me a silent look of warning. Get out! I realised he was intentionally keeping the fiery man's back to us, hoping Sadie and I would escape unnoticed. Sadie was still groggy. I managed to drag her behind a column into the shadows. When she started to protest, I clamped my hand over her mouth. That woke her up. She saw what was happening and stopped fighting. Alarms blared. Fire circled around the doorways of the gallery. The guards had to be on their way, but I wasn't sure if that was a good thing for us. Dad crouched to the floor, keeping his eyes on the enemy, and opened his painted wooden box. He brought out a small rod like a ruler. He muttered something under his breath, and the rod elongated into a wooden staff as tall as he was. Sadie made a squeaking sound. I couldn't believe my eyes either, but things only got weirder. Dad threw his staff at the fiery man's feet and it changed into an enormous serpent, ten feet long and as big around as I was, with coppery scales and glowing red eyes. It lunged at the fiery man who effortlessly grabbed the serpent by his neck. The man's hand burst into white hot flames and the snake burned to ashes. An old trick, Julius, the fiery man chided. My dad glanced at us, silently urging us again to run. Part of me refused to believe any of this was real. Maybe I was unconscious having a nightmare. Next to me, Sadie picked up a chunk of stone. How many? My dad asked quickly, trying to keep the fiery man's attention. How many did I release? Why, all five, the man said. 
as if explaining something to a child. You should know where package damaging is. Soon I'll release even more, and they'll be very grateful. I should be named King again. The demon days, my father said. They'll stop you before it's too late. The fireman laughed. You think the house can stop me? Those old fools can't even stop arguing among themselves. Now let the story be told anew, and this time you shall never rise. The fiery man waved his hand. The blue circle at Dad's feet went dark. Dad grabbed for his toolbox, but it skittered across the floor. Goodbye, Osiris, the fiery man said, with another flick of his hand. He conjured a glowing coffin around our Dad. At first it was transparent, for as our father struggled and pounded on its sides, the coffin became more and more solid, a golden Egyptian sarcophagus inlaid with jewels. My dad caught my eyes one last time and mouthed the word, run. Before the coffin sank into the floor, as if the ground had turned to water. Dad, I screamed. Sadie threw her stone, but it sailed harmlessly through the fiery man's head. He turned, and for one terrible moment, his face appeared in the flames. What I saw made no sense. It was as if someone had superimposed two different faces on top of each other. One almost human, with pale skin, cruel, angular features and glowing red eyes. The other, like an animal with dark fur and sharp fangs. Worse than a dog, or a wolf, or a lion. Some animal I'd never seen before. Those red eyes stared at me, and I knew I was going to die. Behind me, heavy footsteps echoed on the marble floor of the great court. Voices were barking orders. The security guards, maybe the police, but they never get here in time. The fiery man lunged at us. A few inches from my face, something shoved it backwards. The air sparked with electricity. The ambulance around my neck grew uncomfortably hot. The fireman hissed, guarding me more carefully. So, it's you. The building shook again at the opposite end of the room. Part of the wall exploded in a brilliant flash of light. Two people stepped through the gap. The man and the girl we'd seen at the needle. Their robes swirling around them. Both of them held staffs. The fiery man snarled. He looked at me one last time and said, Soon. Then the entire room erupted in flames. A blast of heat sucked all the air out of my lungs and I crumpled to the floor. The last thing I remember, the man with the forked beard and the girl in blue was standing over me. I heard the security guards running and shouting, getting closer. The girl crouched over me and drew a long curved knife from her belt. We must act quickly, she told the man. Not yet, he said with some reluctance. His thick accents in French. You must be sure before we destroy them. I closed my eyes and drifted into unconsciousness. 3. Imprisoned with my cat. Give me the mic. Hello, Sadie here. My brother's a rubbish storyteller. Sorry about that. But now you've got me, so all is well. Let's see. The explosion. Rosetta Stone in a billion pieces. Fiery evil bloke, dad box in a coffin, creepy Frenchman, and Arab girl with a knife. Us passing out, right? So when I woke up, the police were rushing about, as you might expect. They separated me from my brother. I didn't really mind that part. He's a pain anyway. But they locked me in the curator's office for ages. And yes, they used our bicycle chain to do it. Cretins. I was shattered, of course. I'd just been knocked out by a fiery whatever it was. I watched my dad get packed in a sarcophagus and shot through the floor. I tried to tell the police about all that, but did they care? No. Worst of all, I had a lingering chill as if someone was pushing ice-cold needles into the back of my neck. It had started when I looked at those blue glowing words Dad had drawn on the Rosetta Stone, and I knew what they meant. A family disease, perhaps? Can knowledge of boring Egyptian stuff be hereditary? With my luck, 